All right, church, good morning again. Let's pray together, shall we? Father, help us this morning to understand your life-giving words. Father, your son's resurrection transformed our lives and the world forever. Thank you, Father. Amen. Okay, church, so the anticipation of Holy Week has subsided. The intensity of Good Friday is over. And the celebration of Resurrection Sunday has concluded, but he is risen. Thanks be to God. So together, church, we will passionately enter back into John's Gospel, chapter 5, where we left off three weeks ago before Palm Sunday, continuing our sermon series, A Year of Good News. And let's remind ourselves this morning that the prologue of John's Gospel, which is chapter 1, verses 1 to 18, is an executive summary of the entire book, meaning everything that comes after the prologue supports this thesis, that Jesus is the Son of God, with an emphasis on his relationship to the Father. The importance of this context is paramount when studying John's gospel. And so we'll give attention to the end of chapter 5, verses 31 to 47, where Jesus concludes heaven's keynote speech. But let's briefly recap the main points from the previous section in John 5, 16 to 30. Jesus preached to the Jewish leaders that he gives life, that only he is the ultimate judge, that salvation is found only in him and that he is equal to the Father. And so this morning, Jesus continues his teaching. But he does so knowing wholeheartedly the terminal heart condition of the Jewish leaders. Guys, Jesus knew that they were entrenched in their religious system. That even though the truth incarnate was right in front of them, they would need even more evidence to believe his claim. It's breathtaking to me how patient Jesus is with all of us. He cares so deeply about every human heart, which is exactly why he'll continue his heart examination on the Jewish leaders. But the inspection is not just for these zealots, church. It's for us too. Because Christ is quite aware of our fallen nature as a human family. Can I have more good news already for us? And it's that in our brokenness, God's overwhelming grace provides what we need. And so out of deep compassion for the religious leaders, Jesus provides not one, not two, not three, not four, but five testimonies that support his claim to be one with the Father. Today, he's drawing a line in the sand, church. And I really believe with all my soul that Jesus drew the line And gave us so many examples of his divinity because he knows the only cure for our terminal heart condition is him. And so let's begin today's heart examination by reading John chapter 5, verses 31 to 39. This is God's word. If I testify, testify about myself, my testimony is not true. There's another who testifies in my favor, and I know that his testimony about me is true. You have sent to John, and he has testified to the truth. Not that I accept human testimony, but I mention it that you may be saved. John was a lamp that burned and gave light, 
and you chose for a time to enjoy his light. I have testimony weightier than that of John for the works that the Father has given me to finish. The very works that I am doing testify that the Father has sent me and the Father who sent me has himself testified concerning me. You've never heard his voice nor seen his form, nor does his word dwell in you, for you do not believe the one he sent. You study the scriptures diligently because you think that in them you have eternal life. These are the very scriptures that testify about me. Church, this is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. In the big book of Alcoholics Anonymous, chapter two is entitled, We Agnostics. And the big book does this because there are many people who enter the program who deeply struggle to believe in God. And on page 53 of the big book, the paragraph reads this. Crushed by a self-imposed crisis, we cannot postpone or evade. We had to fearlessly face the proposition that God is either everything or else he's nothing. God either is or he isn't, what was our choice to be? Church, this quote, in my opinion, articulates the exact condition of the Jewish leader's hearts. We can substitute words like this, crushed by the impossibility of keeping the law of Moses, the fulfillment of their Hebrew scriptures, Jesus was walking among them, yet they considered him nothing. To put it frankly, church, Jesus was dealing with a very stubborn lot. But honestly, for me, that offers us a lot of hope because we all are a stubborn lot and sometimes the pain has to become so great before we finally make a decision to change. So Jesus, in his love, does what he's always done. We preach about it over and over, week after week. He walks and responds to the pain. But this time, he mounts the evidence for us through testimony and hopes to heal our terminal heart condition. Remember, guys, Jesus doesn't just walk towards the pain and address it. He he wants you to get well. He wants us to pick up our mat and walk. And so let's break down these five testimonies together. The first testimony, Jesus testifies regarding himself. He says, if I testify about myself, My testimony is not true. Brilliant. Just brilliant. Jesus is speaking the language that the Jewish leaders would understand by using Deuteronomy 19, verse 15, which says this. One witness is not enough to convict anyone accused of any crime or offense that they may have committed. A matter must be established by testimony of two or three witnesses right off the bat. We acknowledge and can see Jesus' humility. Humility, church, is the greatest spiritual virtue we have as Christians. And what he's doing here is he's saying, even though I'm one with the Father, I will, out of my love for you, provide you with more reasons to believe in me beyond what I've already said. And so he offers the second testimony from John the Baptist, 
where the Bible says you have sent to John and he has testified to the truth. Remember John's radical reputation amongst the Jewish leaders? His relentless desire to point people towards Christ? John's testimony in chapter 1, verse 23 says, John replied in the words of Isaiah the prophet, I am the voice of one calling in the wilderness. Make straight the way for the Lord. Without question, John was a gateway for the religious leaders to believe. The third testimony involves the works of Jesus. The scripture says, I have testimony weightier than that of John for the works that the Father has given me to finish the very works that I am doing testify that the Father has sent me. Jesus' works bear witness to the very heart of God, offering glorious grace and kind-heartedness. To name just a few examples, the Samaritan woman, the royal son, the paralyzed man, he showed mercy to them all and even did it on the Sabbath. The problem here for the Jewish leaders is that their mindset was wrong. They were looking for military miracles, but Jesus came with miracles of mercy instead. In a war-torn world right now, church, where everybody's defensive and looking to fight. Can we imitate that mercy unto others? Can we afford an opportunity for anger to be transformed into acceptance? For resentment to be transformed into forgiveness? We can. And we must. Now even the Father will testify. The word says, and the father who has sent me has himself testified concerning me. The evidence of this testimony is overwhelming from Jesus' baptism in Luke 3, 22, where the Bible says, and the Holy Spirit descended on him in bodily form like a dove, and a voice came from heaven, you are my son, whom I love. With you, I am well pleased. And lastly, the scripture testifies. The gospel says, these are the very scriptures that testify about me. The Jewish leaders and all who studied Torah took very seriously the word of God. Jesus was and is the actual fulfillment of what they knew and revered so well. And so out of his love, he provides these testimonies because Jesus so badly wants to open the eyes of those who don't believe so that they can be transformed by his love, his mercy, his grace, his kindness and not miss out on the abundant life he offers. But guys, the struggle for people to believe is real. And Jesus addresses the struggle to believe in verses 40 to 44. Here's what the word says. Yet you refuse to come to me to have life. I do not accept glory from human beings, but I know you. I know that you do not have the love of God in your hearts. Could you imagine Jesus saying that to you? I have come in my Father's name and you do not accept me. But if someone else comes in his own name, you will accept him. How can you believe since you accept glory from one another, but do not seek the glory that comes from only God? We are living in a world that craves affirmation. 
It's idolatry, really. We want praise from people constantly. I remember when Pastor Greg brought me into his study one day and he looked me in the eyes with the conviction that only Pastor Greg can do with the smile that fills up a stadium, right? Pastor Greg's smile fills up a stadium. And he said, young man, you preach to honor and exalt Jesus and that's it. It changed my life. We seek glory from friends on platforms like Facebook and Snapchat. We seek glory in our primary relationships, our work environments, the teams that we play on. It's a daily grapple for all of us. And my God, church, the truth is that my generation, the millennials and the generation after me, the Gen Zs, they're even more susceptible because we grew up in the era of selfies posting self-glorifying photos on social media in hopes to get at least 100 likes in the first 10 minutes. And if we don't, let's delete it. Right now, our world really needs a heart examination from Jesus. Church, I'm... I'm talking about the heart examination that counts. The one that counts at the end of life. The only things people really want to talk about at a, mo at a memorial service. What type of love did we bring into the world? Were we known for our kindness and our grace unto others? Was forgiveness our default choice rather than resentment? Did we commit to God in every area of our lives? This is what matters to God's heart. Last Sunday, right before Easter, I called Madeline. She was my drug and alcohol counselor when I was at St. Vincent's Hospital at 23 years old. We haven't spoken in over 10 years. She helped save me from addiction, church, certainly a terminal heart condition. I left her a voicemail. I gave her an update about my life. I told her about my calling and how much I love this church, NPC. I told her I've been sober for a decade I told her about my beautiful babies and another little nugget on the way. Keep them coming, Pastor Greg. Let's go. I told her, thank you for sharing the love of God with me. I'm, I'm so grateful, though. I'm so grateful that when Madeline responded, she didn't affirm me. She didn't glorify me. She responded like John the Baptist. She pointed back to the cross, glorifying God. Glorifying him alone. If there's any lesson that I reveal to this church that I love so much, it is this. Only God's approval leads to authentic contentment. Lesson number two. When God uses our gifts and talents to impact his world, it is never about us. It is always about Jesus. All glory to God. All glory unto God. Okay, church, let's finish. Verses 45 to 47. But do not think I will accuse you before the Father. Your accuser 
is Moses, on whom your hopes are set. If you believed Moses, you would believe me too. For Moses wrote about me. But since you don't believe what he wrote, how are you going to believe what I say? Okay, guys, Jesus is turning up the heat. He's turning up the heat on the Jewish leaders because they prided themselves on being true followers of Moses. In other words, to say that their accuser is Moses would have stung them to fury. But this point is really important because here we see religious leaders who were intellectually elite but spiritually bankrupt. Because Moses wrote about Jesus in Genesis 3, Numbers 21, Deuteronomy 18. And they wouldn't even receive Moses' testimony, which speaks directly to the condition of their hearts. But here's the thing. Jesus did not call the Jewish leaders to a new or different faith. What he called them to was to believe what Moses, what the scripture, what his works, what John the Baptist each testified about him. That he is the Messiah, the son of God. And the reality is we're all born into this world with a terminal heart condition and it's called sin. But there is a cure. The cure is faith in Jesus. No over-the-counter medicine, no physical therapy, no surgery, just faith. Just a conscious decision in our hearts to declare that Jesus is everything. Thanks be to God, church. Let's pray. Holy Spirit, so we come to you this day, not in any form of judgment, self-righteousness, or belief in our minds that we're better than others, but we recognize our own humanity, our inadequacies, our own selfishness and pride, and we come to you on bed and knee, asking you, Lord, to remove those things in our hearts that pull us away from you, that each morning that we hit our knees in humility, recognizing our need for grace, that you would examine our hearts and remove from us the very things that stop us from being your light, your love, your example, your hope to your world. All glory, Father, goes to your Son, Jesus Christ, our risen Lord. Thanks be to God.